I thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Ivan, uh, to uh, uh, to give us this opportunity to get a PDP one hour learning. Ivan is a long time lawyer. I know person I, uh, Ivan a long time as a uh, good friend, and he also a legal advisor to the Chinese <laughs> Professional Association, what we call Kappa, and giving a, a Kappa a lot of advice. And uh, I engage if you guys don't know Kappa, you should contact David David Tam, you know, to uh, get the form to join Kappa members. It's only a hundred dollars for life, and and they offer a lot of program. Later on, you guys can contact uh, uh, this uh, David Tam, you know, to join Kappa member. I encourage uh, my lawyer Pacific colleague, you guys should join Kappa. We can get together. And uh, you know we can uh, make this association even stronger. Uh, thank you, Ivan. I'll leave it to you. No, thank you, Singh, and um, um, thank you for that introduction. Uh, um, and really, uh, I've known Singh for years, and we do uh, instead of more than just real estate, we do a lot of charitable activities together. So it's been a right. pleasure to known you for so so long, and I'm really happy to be invited, to, uh, David, uh, to invite me as well to to present to your uh, agents. Uh, that was a great presentation. I'm looking forward to maybe helping some of you guys in 2025 to complete some of these too. Um, and one of the things um, that I wanted to uh, um, uh, talk a little bit of today is residential tenancy, especially in the last couple of months and in terms of what has been happening uh, with COVID and new laws and legislation. Uh, because in the last, uh, from March until May, actually until July actually, I've been involved in a lot of uh, litigation involved with residential tenancy board disputes, um, mainly on behalf of landlords who, and also on behalf of sellers. So in some of the scenarios that come up, uh, David had um, asked me to do a presentation uh, because this topic has been very live. Um, so in, uh, can everybody see my screen? I just wanna make sure. So the topic, residential tenancy issues in the age of COVID-19, evictions, vacant possession and rent collection. I mainly focus on rent and uh, collection and payment of rent because there's a lot of other issues when it comes to residential tenancy and the disputes are always commingled when it comes to a hearing um, so in addition to not paying rent there's usually disputes over renovations or or repairs and things like that but i want to focus on this because this issue has come up as realtors in the last couple of months i had buyers who had uh, wanted a vacant possession of a home um, the completion was sometime in april and then all of a sudden in March, the government announced the ban on evictions, um, no matter what. And in some situations that the tenant said, hey, I don't have to leave. And now the buyer is in a position of not being able to have a vacant home. The seller is in contravention of their obligations under the contract to give vacant possession. I've had situations as well where the um, uh, the two months notice, legal notice had been given um, prior to the time, like, uh, and then subjects have been removed, and then this thing happens as well. So th these are just a, t a touch of what's going to happen. And many of you would have uh, buyers and uh, sellers maybe thinking of buying a place with a tenancy or selling a place with a tenancy. So these, it's good to be aware of these kinds of issues that come up. Okay, because the whole process of the residential tenancy board doesn't have to be a mystery. Uh, they, you know, they do require a lot of um, uh, evidentiary and uh, legal thought and um, uh, and processes involved, and it's good to know that all. So today I'm going to touch about all of it, so you have a refresher, a background, as well as some things to think about. Okay, um, my this is my information here. Um, I have my email if you want a hyperlink to this presentation. It's on a PowerPoint and Adobe. If you want links to the legislation or case law that's presented, uh, you can email me. Um, one thing as well, uh, I, I liked how, uh, uh, Dave, you had a few presentations for prizes. That I have one too at the very end too as well. So I just want to let you guys know it's going to be an Amazon uh, gift card. So we don't have to go anywhere. I can send it to you. And uh, when we get to the very end, they'll give that prize out, okay, and uh, have a contest. Just a bit about myself, I've been practicing real estate for 23 years. Uh, I do both uh, transactional cases like residential, commercial purchases and sales and refinances, um, but also when it comes to um, partnerships and joint ventures and agreements to develop a house together to sell. Also litigation, um, I'm involved in um, 
both Supreme Court and also small claims when it comes to different issues, patent and latent defects, breaches of contracts, um, and most lately uh, dealing with tenancy, of course, um, uh, sellers who are, are breach of their contracts, they can't give vacant possession to the homes and uh, other situations as well. And uh, during COVID, all kinds of things happen. I had uh, even a buyer that passed away. Uh, my client was a seller uh, because of COVID and there was difficulties to try to figure out how to deal with uh, um, whether the frustration of the contract occurred or not. Anyways, my cell phone is here. This is for your agents, um, not for clients. I, I have an office number in which clients call, but if you need any help, uh, many of the agents of Krepa and David would let you know that if I'm accessible in terms of if you need something, to just get past that line to to, to, to draft something on the contract. I'm okay to, to give you a quick update in terms of what you need to know or what you how you should draft something uh, into the contract as well. So, um, and there we go. So the first thing I want to tell you about where to find information besides if you seek a legal advice or a lawyer to help you with a tenancy issue, where do you find it? What places to look at? I want to show you this briefly. There's, a, there's the act itself, uh, the Residential Tenancy Act, and there's regulations that deal with the enforcement of the act. If you type in residential tenancy BC and rules of procedure, that tells you about how the conduct of residential tenancy hearings are, 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 are are dealt with in terms of the procedure. Um, the guidelines, this is a, something that arbitrators at the board use in order to make decisions uh, for cases in front of them. It's very important. There's a item 52, the fifth guideline number 52 just came out recently. Um, that has to deal with uh, rent payments that are late during the, didn't get paid during the month of March until, until August and what to do with those. And that's gonna be, I'll talk about that later. And last but not least, uh, past decisions. If you go under the Residential Tenancy Board, you can look up past decisions. Um, you can put in keywords. They won't, uh, they won't list it out in terms of what is more relevant or not, but it's useful to see how other cases have been decided, um, whatever the situation may be. You can put occupancy, renovation, you can put in hike, rent, um, and, and see what the cases come up and see how they've been decided. <clears throat> these are just a good sense. So you, uh, you, hey, you have a situation, you want to know what it says. These are good places to go look um, to let you know where to find it if you need to. Again, if you send me the uh, an email wanting the this presentation on a on the link, I'll have hyperlinks to each of these for you. So uh, I want to talk uh, uh, touch on some of the topics that have come up um, in the last five months or so that have been accentuated because of COVID. Um, failure to pay rent is number one. Tenants who have been laid off work, uh, who are self-employed people who have, have their, their uh, jobs and their, not only their, their, their workplace uh, been closed to, uh, because of COVID and, and therefore they can't pay rent. Um, buyers and during this period of time or sellers who are supposed to give vacant possession. These two things are combined, uh, uh, two issues there um, in which they can't. Um, the tenants won't leave, um, the seller's in breach, and the buyer has potentially a house that they don't need because they want an empty home to live in uh, for their family, but not with tenants if they're not looking for residences, uh, looking for an investment property. Orders for possession, um, you can, you know, how to get it, where to get it, but even if you got it, can you even enforce it? So during from May until July, even if you had an order of possession to remove a tenant, you can't even enforce it. And so that was an issue as well. How to get it, and once you get it, what to do with it. Next one, frustration of contract. That has come up a lot because people wonder, is COVID a, fr a reason to call a contract, no matter what kind of contract, including tenancy, including real estate purchase and sale contract? Uh, hey, because of COVID, I lost my job. Is that a frustration? Can I back out? Um, so those issues come up. Repeated rent as well because people are having a tough time uh, paying their rent and they, they can pay some, but not all, and they can pay all of it later and happens uh, frequently or periodically. That is an issue that's come up. And then extenuating circumstances, which um, is a, how would you say, a reason for parties in a contract not to fulfill their obligations? Is there uh, reasons uh, to not fulfill and, and be excused from those contracts? Uh, and that's an argument that uh, a lot of landlords have used in terms of extenuating circumstances for their obligations. 
So anyways, I just want to touch now, uh, not only places where to find the law and some of the issues that have come up, but the process. What, how, uh, how, does, uh, how does a hearing happen? What happens? In the last four or uh, five months, uh, they've been ongoing because unlike the Supreme Court and Provincial Court that were closed, it's by video conference or by telephone primarily by telephone. So these hearings have continued to happen. Applications have continued to be heard before arbitrators. Parties phone in with an access code so that uh, the, the tenant has a code and the, the uh, landlord has a code and they each bring their own evidence. You still have to serve documents and, that, and there was a brief time where you don't have to serve personally. That They had exceptions to allow people to serve documents by email that, that has now closed and no, no longer that is allowed. Um, evidence can be in included in uh, all kinds of things, and it's different than provincial and supreme court. One thing you have to know is hearsay is allowed. Documents that technically would not be permitted in supreme court can sometimes be allowed in, and they call it all as evidence. You can include case law. They call that evidence, even though it's, um, you know, and you have to follow the same timelines to submit these documents. Letters, photos, videos, audio clips, everything is downloaded, submitted, forwarded. Um, you can send in thumbnail, thumbnail drives. Uh, uh, you can also send it by email with attachments. You have to make sure that the other side um, can actually open and read them as well. Now one thing about um, witnesses, um, each side can bring their witnesses in, they can phone in, uh, but during the testimony of other witnesses they're not allowed to listen. Uh, so they're not allowed to be in the room or hearing what has been happening while other witnesses talk. Um, and then cross-examination is allowed. Um, so, be, you know, any witnesses you bring forward, be prepared if the other side is represented by a lawyer, or even if the, the landlord or tenant was the other party, they can cross-examine and ask questions. Um, the arbitrator usually decides how and when, and what strategy and what procedure, okay? And uh, in terms of who goes first, in terms of presenting their evidence, applicants are usually first unless there's a challenge to the landlord's actions as being not genuine, and then the landlord goes first. And I can talk about that a little bit later. A decision is usually rendered in writing, not rarely ever verbally at the hearing, and it's usually within a week or two of the hearing itself. In terms of timing, um, you can look at the time an application is made to a hearing about a month to a month and a half, um, and then the decision after. So you can gauge some of the timelines for a hearing. And that was kind of regular during the, the last couple of months through March until July. So um, some of the other timelines to be uh, aware of, and these are important when you do contracts. Um, if, uh, in particular, if you want to have a buyer that wants to have an empty home, you want to know how much notice you need to give and write that uh, language in your contract and other ideas. So I give you these four um, guidelines in terms of notice period required and the amount of compensation if needed. So if a tenant had not paid rent, um, there's a 10 day notice to leave or give to the tenant to uh, um, leave the premises. No compensation is required to be given to the tenant. Um, if it's for cause, for example, if the tenant has been causing a nuisance to other tenants, um, uh, uh, engaging in criminal conduct, uh, there's a whole bunch of list of things in which the tenant can do, which can give rise to a landlord to say, hey, I give you one month's notice, you have to leave. Um, there's no compensation needed for that, but it's a one month notice. And um, then if the seller um, wants to, um, uh, sorry, if the landlord wants to live in the home, or if the buyer wants to buy a home and live in, there's tenants, um, there's a two months notice required and a one month rent, which is required under the law to give as compensation to the tenant. And quite often what people do is they, they, they forgive, uh, uh, they don't collect the last month's rent and that stands in place as compensation of actual uh, compensation given. And then there's another section dealing with renovations. If the owner wants to renovate or even if the buyer wants to buy a place in order to renovate, um, and then there's a whole bunch of rules relating to that. And then there's a four months notice required and one month rent compensation. These are important because the residential tenancy board, they stick to these rules. And the, you're short one day or two days and you don't allow it, it's thrown out. So you better be careful. So besides this, um, I wanna talk about uh, the item two, which is the reasons for um, um, uh, giving an uh, eviction notice to a tenant for a cause. 
Um, so section 47 of the act talks about this. A landlord may end the tenancy by giving notice if, and one particular case I wanna talk about is paying rent, because we're talking about rent, this, this, this topic. There's other kinds of issues, but rent in particular. Um, if a client or tenant, sorry, has not been paying rent on time, they've been repeatedly rent, um, is being paid late. Um, so can you use this as a reason? So there's special rules for that. Um, the guidelines um, that I mentioned before talk about what, how they define repeated. Um, so here, at least three times, um, there are late paying rent. So you're late twice, it doesn't count. Um, so, uh, but but even if you do three, um, if it's consecutive, it doesn't matter. If you miss one in between, uh, maybe one every two months, um, that doesn't matter. Uh, but if there are three late payments in a long period of time, this may be used against the landlord uh, because the, each time that they're late may not be considered consecutive enough or enough to add up to three. So just be be warned and be careful. And the case law is all over the place on this aspect. Um, another thing, um, now uh, starting July 2nd, um, the new rules have come out. Landlords can enforce orders of possession obtained for reasons other than the non-payment of rent. So if there's a renovation order of possession, if there's an order of possession because of cause, um, anything other than um, for non-payment of rent, um, those can be enforced now. Okay, um, but here, non-payment of rent has been the biggest issue though. Um, for all my clients who are landlords and they own houses and the, the, the tenants don't pay, they say, what do we do? What can we do? So from March until August, there's no 10-day notice of evictions. It could be given until, well, just recently and started in September. That ban on evictions for non-payment of rent has just been lifted. But even then, if the uh, tenant did not pay during the month of March or April or May or June, um, that still cannot be used as a reason to enforce that um, uh, order of possession if you get it. Um, because now uh, the new law has been implemented to protect the uh, tenants, uh, they have to have a repayment plan given to the tenant um, for anything that was due and missing for the last couple of months. So they can't enforce it. And then they have until um, next year to pay it. So on September 1st, landlords must think of and record and devise a plan serve on the tenant a repayment plan and give 30 days for the plan to take effect. So beginning of September 1st, you still have a 30 day notice period. Um, uh, you have to give it to the tenant um, and then you have to start paying it uh, for the tenant to pay. You have to give them time to pay. Um, um, I wanna talk uh, now a little bit about, um, um, uh, let me go back a little bit here, here. Um, so, so right here in the middle bulletin, uh, middle bullet, July 21st, 2021, they have that much time in order to pay, paying according to the, pre the, uh, the payment plan. The payment plan itself has to have some rules as well. And if you look at the guidelines, it's like a 13, 15 page document on how in which these payment plans work. They have to be equal installments um, until July 21st. So if you have a, a tenant that had missed payment of 2000 a month um, from March and April and May. Uh, and then they have $6,000 of rent payments overdue. Um, then they have to divide that from whenever the time they give their notice, say for example, it starts on October 1st, then they have October until July and divide that into equal months. So that's like nine months to divide that $6,000 into equal installments. Only if the tenant does not pay that installment plan, then you can issue the 10-day notice based on uh, unpaid rent. So these are all specific rules that have just come out. Um, it's pretty complicated in terms of what these things are, uh, but read the guidelines if you want. And if you have a client that, that's thinking of, uh, you know, if you're selling a, a property that has a tenant and their tenant hasn't paid rent, this is gonna be an issue. You're gonna have buyers that wonder, hey, what's gonna happen with rent? Where is rent gonna be paid? Who's gonna be paid to? Um, is the landlord going to collect? Is the buyer going to collect and give back to the seller? These are all issues that will come up. Okay. Now, another situation that's come up is, uh, you know, when you have a lot of clients, uh, buyers who want to play buy this place uh, and want to live in their home and have the the uh, their family members live in, or if you have a, a current owner of a house that wants to sell it. And I'm uh, sorry, not sell it, but have their own family uh, live in the home that prior to that time was rented. 
So um, landlord's use of property applies when a landlord is going to move in with a close family member uh, himself or herself or with a close family member or sell the property and the new buyer wants to move in. But close family member, I just want to give you this, means father, mother or child of the landlord or the landlord's spouse does not include brother or sister of the landlord or brother or sister of the landlord's spouse. You gotta be clear. Um, quite often they can enforce that idea that uh, it's not close enough in order to be count. Um, there's some situations such as family corporations and different shareholders wanting to move into a family held uh, assets held by family owned corporations. So there's specific rules for that. I won't go much further detail except that it exists. Now, um, two main issues that have arisen because of these. Well, tenant doesn't want to leave and says, hey, don't, I don't have to leave, even if there was a, you know, a valid notice was given. Um, and then sometimes like the tenant disputes the notice on a bad faith basis. Now, this is very important because in the last uh, four months, uh, about six or seven of these residential tenancy board hearings that I've attended on behalf of landlords, the tenancy is complaining about bad faith. Um, and I'll talk about what that means in a minute. Okay, go to my next screen. Um, so um, issues that have come up during this period of time when the tenant doesn't vacate, uh, there's a moratorium and then the seller is in breach of that contract. Um, you know, again, this is again, some issues that have arisen. Buyers have cited frustration. Hey, look, I can back out of this contract because you can't give me a, a vacant home. Those uh, allegations and, and so topic, topics have been in heated discussion in the last little while as well. And buyers then sometimes, uh, you know, if they, they buy and then they turn around, sell, sue, they sell it for breach of contract, they will likely win. Um, then the problem is damages. What happens if they, you know, they sue? What, what compensation? Uh, how are you going to calculate compensation? Some of the things that have been in discussion in the last little while when with clients of mine is a tenant will maybe have to rent a place until they move in, until the tenants leave, so they can have costs such as uh, their hotel stays or if they sold a house and they're living in another place until they move in. Costs of legal fees to deal with this, um, you know, all kinds of different issues. So these, these are all things that uh, uh, may be negotiated and talked about and be claimed on in a lawsuit if it involves the tenants not leaving. And then the fact that in the last couple of months I have been in actually involved in on behalf of uh, buyers and on behalf of sellers defending and, and suing and also selling and negotiating successfully sometimes as well between the buyer and seller to get out of the situation. Sometimes it's a breach of contract, yes, and you look at the, the facts and you look at the evidence and then you recommend the client to either reduce the price if you're a seller uh, to compensate or to take the chance and risk that the buyer will not complete or complete and not sue. So these are all issues. Highly recommend that you see legal advice when those issues come up. So I talked a little bit about good faith. Um, this is a big issue when it comes to, uh, to tenants. They allege that the landlord is uh, really not really wanting to move in and they really want to just jack up the rent um, and take over and live for a few months and then uh, renovate perhaps and the and the, uh, the, the, the the tenant invariably allege that the landlord has other motivations. So I want to talk about this issue in particular because that has been a highly fought and contested issue in the last couple of months. So um, definition though of what is good faith, this is in the guidelines. So again, how is it interpreted? So hey, I, I really mean to kick the tenants out, but that's not the point. Okay, there, you can have other reasons. So here, definition, that means a landlord has honest intentions and no ulterior motive. The landlord must honestly intend to use the rental site for the purposes stated on the notice to end the tenancy, such as for cause, such as for occupancy, such as for renovations. There may be extenuating circumstances that allow the residential tenancy board to excuse the landlord for not moving in or occupying. In this particular case, um, prior to a case that I argued in July, there was nothing dealing with COVID as a reason. And I was able to successfully argue on behalf of a landlord that COVID and the situation surrounding it is an extenuating circumstance that allows the landlord not to do what they're supposed to do um, according to that the, the reasons for giving the notice of eviction, such as occupancy, such as renovations, okay? Um, here, I want to go further um, because here, next one. How to fight allegations of bad faith. Um, I'll give you uh, a good documentary evidence is very important. 
rational, reasonable testimony, nothing exaggerated, and independent witnesses as much as you can. Gather all these things to fight these allegations if you have to go to court. Um, I want to talk about a, a, an actual case because it's pretty, uh, let me, uh, sorry, let me uh, control this bullet point here. Uh, yeah, so um, this particular case here um, um, had a client who had a really low offer on a uh, on a price of a property because the seller wanted a quick sale. No subjects, didn't want it as want it as is. Don't want to subject to inspection. My buyers were renovators, uh, contractors, so they hey no problem. We'll move in. We'll give the two uh, two months notice to uh, the tenants to leave. And whatever happens, we can know we know how to fix. So my clients purchased a home uh, with the purpose of intending to live in it, but didn't really care because it was a good deal. The previous landlord had a long history of problems with the tenants, and that's why the landlord or the seller wanted to, to sell. But this is important because you may not ever get to know that detail. You may never get that history, and, and then you know that my situation may come. So the clients bought, um, and then the day of possession that the the, the landlords were giving the notice of uh, eviction to the tenants, the tenant says, did you know, you must have known that the landlord had all these repair orders that they were supposed to pay and fix and take care of, but they didn't do. And the landlord uh, said, no, I don't know, but, uh, but you know, you're going to be living here for two more months, and two more months is a long time. Believe me, it's for issues to come up. If there's a leak that happens, um, if something happens with uh, discovery of mold in the house, anything could happen in two months before they leave. So if I were acting on behalf of a buyer, there's tenants, make sure the tenants are gone before you buy or else you inherit a whole history of problems. And the history of problems that relate to the previous landlord, guess what? It follows to the new buyer if it relates to repairs. It doesn't relate to personal things such as, uh, you know, um, uh, trespassing or uh, threats and violence or those types of things. But if there's repair, it follows. So better be careful, okay? The, uh, the tenants disputed the notice and then they decided, hey, not only do we dispute it, we don't have to leave because the guidelines, the emergency guidelines came in. And so, but we still have to fight this thing because my clients wanted to buy and sell and move in. So they said that uh, the clients had an ulterior motive to avoid having to repair all those previous uh, work orders. It was extensive orders to be done. So when we went to the hearing, one of the things that we had, uh, which was good, uh, we had um, convincing documents from the purchase. All the documents confirmed that the buyer wanted to buy this place for their principal residence, PTT form has the uh the property listed that they're buying as the as the uh, as the address the form a transfer has the evidence of the address of their buying as the home in which the tax notice will be sent to um there's no exemptions um there's no no um for example in one document we got which was really good was the mortgage uh, advisor saying that they analyzed analyzed the mortgage as a principal residence not as a rest investment property so we have all these documents that preceded the purchase that can prove and that what the judge was able to look at favorably, reliably, as evidence of prior intention. Now, you know, the uh, as, as I mentioned, the definition of uh, is good faith is that there's no other motive. There cannot be any other motive. If part of it is, yeah, I want to renovate, maybe sell later down the line, that's, that's grounds for the, uh, the tenant to win on that case. You've got to stick to that main focused intention that was on the notice of eviction, okay? So um, here I mentioned about some of the documentation that was very useful in overcoming that allegation um, because it was such a previous history that there's uh, of, of repairs to be done. So you have to al assemble a good source and that's a good selection of good, reliable evidence and testimony. Okay. What happens if the, the tenants are successful in alleg alleging and saying that the landlord um, didn't in good faith uh, do what they intended to have the, the, in accordance to the notice to end the tenancy? Like, oh, they didn't renovate within four months. They didn't occupy within six months uh, with their family member or close family members. It's 12 months worth of, in, of rent. 
So that's the compensation. That's uh, I don't know if you know this, but this is there. It's right there in the legislation. Um, you don't have to prove that there actually is a loss. This is the penalty. Uh, penalty to a landlord if this found that they were not um, following their uh, the reason for the ending of the tenancy, um, that there was other motivations and other other reasons for whatever they uh, gave the notice for. Um, so that you know they they move in five months later and then they leave one month after. Well, uh, <laughs> that doesn't count. They have this one case where the landlord moved in and to the dot six months to the day they left they said oh hey uh, i don't need that place anymore even then the judge thought they did that on purpose that it was suspicious that they used it only for six months right to the day and then they left so even if you follow to the t this is six months it doesn't guarantee that this is going to be a way for you to avoid the allegation of bad faith okay so very important that you look at all the case law to find out all the ways in which you can avoid having this penalty on your um, landlord uh, client or yourself if you're a landlord yourself um you know um, um be prepared uh so that when you do that notice and if you have a tendency that's disputed be prepared to uh, assemble all the evidence that supports the reasons given now, extenuating circumstances, I mentioned that before. I had a client who his family member was living in the home alone, and then COVID came, and that person says, well, you know, um, uh, it's better to be safer with the family in a family bubble so you can be with the parents. So three months in, they left the home to stay with the family. And so the tenant who had been evicted came back and did surveillance you know, check through the garbage and rummage and say, hey, look, you know, this was something they actually said at the hearing. By five days straight, I went through the garbage and I didn't see any garbage that shows and proves that the, ten the, the landlord wasn't living in the place. I came here at nighttime and three different nights and the lights were all shut. And nobody was entering. I called and knocked on the doors of the neighbors and they said, oh, they didn't see anybody coming and going, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they even brought in the camera and they stuck a little camera through the keyhole to look at the area inside. Say, hey, look, there's nobody there. It's empty. There's no renovations, et cetera, et cetera. You don't know the depth in which some of these tenants have challenged my landlord clients to get evidence. So, yeah, be careful. Uh, now, COVID was a reason uh, because of the dangerousness of uh, other persons living on their own and protecting themselves and being in a bubble. Uh, they, um, and, uh, and uh, you know, if you, anybody wanted a link to the case and look at the case law, uh, prior to that time, I couldn't find anything. There was nothing that showed that as a reason uh, that the pandemic and the issues surrounding it allowed a landlord to, to, to not have to either A, begin renovations, or B, occupy the place for six months as in accordance with their notice of eviction. Okay. Um, these are other cases that have been uh, extenuating circumstances that have been brought up and whether it's been shown to pre be good or not. Um, poor inspection report um, as, as a reason for not moving in, not good enough. Um, loss of job because the, the landlord was going to move in but couldn't afford it anymore, wasn't, wasn't a good reason. Um, and there's a bunch of others. He's a good case law to have because they're all very case specific. Every single one of you may have a situation that may look like it fits into this certain category, but we can take one fact to turn the whole case around. Um, another situation, the landlord gave notice to the tenant uh, for the landlord's use. Um, you know, uh, oh yeah, so this, uh, yeah, I, show, I mentioned this one, <laughs> extenuating circumstances. This was uh, something that I argued with, so I just want to give you that example. Um, uh, lessons on bad faith examples, some good timing. You know, the timing of certain evidence that you collect is very important. Evidence of prior intention, more than six months of use and occupation before renting. So I remember one time I ch um, on behalf of a tenant, I had challenged a landlord's notice of eviction. And uh, the landlord says, yeah, my, uh, my, my dad from LA is uh, moving in. Um, well, then I said, well, when is he moving in? <laughs> There's a ban on travel. Said, Did he sell his house? Uh, the guy had a job in uh, LA. Did he quit his job? Uh, is he still working? Does he have a visa? Does he have an immigration plan? I questioned as a cross-examination to the landlord 
and he couldn't answer any of these questions, which suggests that there was no plan. It was just a thought, but a thought is not a plan. And you got to have more than just a thought in order to have a notice of eviction for the tenant. And then I brought up other ideas that they had long-standing disputes over a, a flood, a recurring flooding, and a sump that was installed by the by the uh, the landlord that didn't work. And that was the reason. So, anyways, be prepared. Good evidence and prior evidence of before an, an, an eviction notice was given. It's very very important. Um. So that's my presentation for today. Um, I just wanted to touch on these issues. Uh, there's all these cases that come up. So I do not only uh, uh, do I invite you, um, if you have any questions, to ask me a question that you may have come up in any of your purchase and sales deals. When it comes to clients who are thinking of buying a pre-sale and thinking, hey, I'm not going to live there as for investment. What do I have to look forward to when it comes to tenants? Of course, you want the good side, good tenants, uh, good paying tenants. But they, you know, um, it's pretty hard. <laughs> and I can give you some tips and guidelines for your clients as to what to do when they're looking for tenants, a credit search, um, those kinds of things that helps. Um, history of cases that may exist in the uh, uh, and the, the residential tenancy board and anything like that. Um, so, anyways, and uh, of course, um, if you are interested in helping uh, uh, clients with their purchase and sales and introducing them to a lawyer, that I can, I. I I've been doing real estate law for 23 years, like I mentioned, in terms of purchases and negotiating all the different things that happen if a deal does not happen or they negotiate, including um, clients in the last little while who didn't have financing because it got pulled just before the completion date of the uh, of the of the pre-sale, the purchase. Um, those happened a lot during the last couple of months as well, um, and uh, and even then. <laughs> Clients uh, who came in and were under quarantine and had to figure out a new way to sign things. So, anyways, anything and everything related to that, you feel free to contact me. My, uh, my, I'm just showing my screen here. This is my office uh, information, so um, my email as well. And for any clients that you may want to introduce, this office number um, for your tenants. Like, if you are to text me uh, with my cell phone, which I had mentioned earlier, uh, with my cell phone number, which is on the very top screen. Uh, make sure that you mention you're at Royal Pacific and you're at the seminar. Um, Sing Yao mentioned CREPA, Chinese Real Estate Professionals Association, which um, I'm affiliated with, the, the legal advisor for CREPA. It's a very good organization. Uh, we host uh, similar seminars like this for agents if you want um, uh, PDPs as well and, uh, and an association of like-minded individuals who are all Chinese trying to sell real estate and helping each other do it. Okay. No, um, so I do have a prize. Um, so this time it's for everybody to type in the first person to type the answer to this in our chat. Let me see if I can open my chat. And it's going to be, huh? Actually, I don't see a chat screen on mine. This is new to me. I haven't used GoToMobile before. Uh, Christine, uh, Christine, you um, can. Yeah, the chat box is right next to. Is on your. Oh, right. I see. Up the corner. Can you see it? Right you see the bubble, right? Yes, I see it. So I'm going to type in the question. Whoever answers first will get an Amazon gift card, and, and you have to type in your email if you get it right. Um, and, and the question. I believe is, there's some questions from my group too. Oh, oh, oh my God. God. Yeah, no, not a problem. We can do questions before I do the prize draw. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, does, do you want to type the question or read out the question or you can unmute them and they can read it out or say it or you can um, type out the question and, and Christine can read out the question. So who, who has the question? Yes, this is also in the chat box. Let me see. Oh. Okay, yeah. the first one is from Becky, Becky Ma. Hi Becky, if, yes. Yeah, if the buyer plan to buy the property for rental, but didn't want to keep the tenant. The seller gives the vacant notice to the tenant. Would the tenant go after the seller or buyer for the 12 months compensation? Yes. Um, so buying a place to rent out is not one of those grounds. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's for your own use and occupation, but not for your own re-rental and depending on it. So, and it happens. If you look at uh, the cases before the residential tenancy board, I don't know how many that I've seen where the tenant 
just looked under Craigslist, was checking under all these uh, rental forums and found the same one that they were kicked out of being rented out. And if they, in within a six month period of time, it didn't happen, they, they applied to the residential tenancy board for a monetary order to pay that. And it happens so much. <laughs> so no, um, buying a place so that you can kick them out and re-rent it, that's not one of the grounds that that's allowed. Okay, another question from Cesar Lee. Hi, Evan, can you speak Cantonese? Yeah, I can speak Cantonese. 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 So I just said I do speak Cantonese. Um, I'm, I'm Canadian born. I'm a CBC, but I also speak Cantonese. And my Mandarin are just beginning to get better. All my staff speaks Mandarin and Cantonese, where I have multilingual fluency. Um, and uh, but my own Mandarin is uh, it's uh, it's getting better. It's Indian. Okay, thank you. Very good, very good indeed. Okay, then another question: Is Tandon giving their listing realtor a hard time? A good reasons for eviction? Yeah. So the agents is uh, you have to be careful um, if you are the listing agent and you're helping the landlord uh, uh, give vacant possession and try to get cooperation, be very, very uh, careful. Um, there was a few cases that have been dealt with in which the tenant, when they went to the residential tenancy board, they used what the emails and texts and what they said that the listing agent told them uh, as if that was evidence about their intentions of the actual landlord or even the intentions of the buyer. Be very, very careful. Um, you know, in one, one sense, if you don't want to be stuck in the middle of saying something which the landlord didn't tell you to say, um, that, um, uh, uh, you know, that's a difficult, difficult situation because it's very dangerous. Um, if you have something written from the landlord and you want to present it to the tenant without any intervening language, um, you might want to get it from the landlord and forward it directly to the tenant through email. You have everything by email, documented, nothing verbal. Uh, trust me, I even had a tenant who recorded what the, uh, the, the listing agent had said about the buyer. Uh, in that, you know, that one case I mentioned to you, the, the, the tenant says, the listing agent said the, the, the buyers are going to assume the tenancy. That means they're going to take over and not kick us out. And so they misinterpret assuming the tenancy as if that was the long-term intention of the buyer. But they didn't hear it from the buyer because their only contact was the listing agent. So they said the, that's what the listing agent told them. And they want to say, hey, that's why we think it's bad faith uh, because the listing agent said that. But the listing agent says, I'm not the buyer's agent. I'm not making representations about what the buyer said or want. But you can see how easily that can be used against you. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, giving you a hard time, yes, it happens, but protect yourself because A, you're the agent of the landlord, but you're also being, will be, your evidence may be called in upon and questioned by the tenancy who is alleging bad faith and using your words to, against the landlords. If there's anything different, inconsistencies between what the landlord said, what the landlord wanted and yourself. And then landlord who's trying to sell the property may in turn, if they can't get the tenancy up, blame you for not doing what they ask you to do. So be be very careful. You're a property management agent. You should know the law when it comes to residential tenancy board disputes before you decide to do that on behalf of your um, uh, be, on behalf of your uh, owner listing agent. Uh, sorry, listing uh, selling client. Okay. Yes, yeah. pretty scary, right? Yeah. So everything yeah. documentary. Yeah, it's exactly like I, I couldn't believe it. Like uh, they're, 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 they, you know, and they, they, they provided texts which they've received as evidence. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I have to call the listing agent online at the hearing so that they can defend themselves. I didn't say that. I don't represent this. And they didn't. They, they've been making all these kinds of allegations, which if they don't show up, you know, nobody's going to say that's not what was said. <laughs> it's he said, she said type of thing. True. Yeah. So, and then and another question is from Lawrence Yan. Any process you can suggest to shape buyers or sellers from extent uh, the circumstance? Yeah, um, there is a provision that allows for mutual agreements to end tenancy. 
Um, the residential density board is quite good at listening and adhering to agreements made uh, between the, the landlord and buyer and the tenant. So you want them to leave out earlier. They actually do want to rent out, right? Um, so they mentioned the previous question. Um, hey, I, I want the, the tenants to leave and I, I don't want to uh, re-rent it. Well, <laughs> if you're successful and able to negotiate a mutual end to end the tenancy so that the tenant knows what the intentions are and agrees to a form of compensation, Hey, can I give you two months notice? Because I'm gonna uh, uh, pay you two months rent instead of the standard one month, and then allow you to sign off and agree. Not and then once you have this agreement, they can't turn around and sue again for something that they already agreed upon. So the the form does exist. The the ways in which you negotiate is quite flexible. But once you have an agreement that the tenant already signed, acknowledging that the the, the buyer wants to renovate and then re-rent it at a higher price. Um, the buyer wants to not rent it for their own family, um, but maybe for a distant relative, um, maybe seven months down the line, maybe eight months down the line, but maybe not immediate. Maybe they want to renovate first before they rent it out, but it's all up there and it's negotiated. Compensation is negotiated. Um, you know that if you don't do that, and then you go ahead and do your own thing anyways on behalf of as a, as a new buyer or landlord, then you might have hit with 12 months worth of rent regardless of the, you know, the, the, of, of how much actual loss yes. suffered from. So $20,000 a month for rent, easily, right? 24000 easily. So, hey, I'll give you 5000 and then sign off on it instead of, you know, and if you negotiate it, then you can, you can, you can work around those, uh, those uh, potential consequences, okay? Sounds good. Answers your question. Um, that was Lawrence, right? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. I actually, uh, Lawrence said that, and he is he's looking for some clauses, which uh, I think this is for the realtors to use, right, to assist the buyers or sellers for extent extent you like aging the I, I can talk if you sense. want. Yeah. Yeah, what I suggest is that because these are drafting issues and every every contract is different when it comes to the purposes upon which the seller wants to sell. And I wouldn't have a catch-all thing except that the uh, you, if you as a, you don't want to have, if you're acting for a buyer or acting for a seller, you want to do something different to protect yourselves. And the buyer doesn't want to have any liabilities for misrepresentation on behalf of what the seller had done. Um, they can possession that you must, you know, if anything... <laughs> Get vacant possession no matter what. Don't 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 take over the don't take over the tenancy and assume that you can turn around and give a notice of eviction. Um, uh, uh, for the seller, um, for the seller, yes, if you have a mutual agreement to end tenancy, that 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 saves you a lot of headaches. Okay. Um, but yeah, for specific clauses, I don't have. I, I can't start typing it out. But if you have a situation that's arisen. Um, I'm sure your managing broker um, uh, and your agents have some, and if you want me to review it, um, let me review it. Um, for myself, I've negotiated separate ones for different specific clients, um, and, it, and it's not a one-size-fits-all type of situation, okay? Now, occupancy for use, a re-rental um, for, um, for renovations, um, for costs, even that, <laughs> and that all, all, that all comes into play. And you write the, the you write the the clause based on the experience of what you think could happen if they challenge it later on. Okay. Okay. Another question is from Raymond. Uh, selling property to a developer with tenants, what is the notice and compensation requirement? Um, run that by me again. Um, for redevelopment. Yeah, selling property for to the developer. Is it any notice or compensation requirement? Is it the same? Selling property to a developer? Yeah. No, the 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 uh, the rules that in the act um, when it comes to um, uh, selling a property that will be renovated or remodeled, um, those those uh, those those uh, those rules don't apply um, differently to to different. It depends on the purpose, not the person. So if the purpose is for redevelopment, it's for uh, demolishing um, and for a re-rental at a higher price, it doesn't matter who, it's the same rules. So, you know, 
the 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 if if it was sold and it was not disclosed to the tenant that the purpose of this was to remodel and to redevelop uh, and then it was found out yeah then you have 12 months of uh, compensation um so as a as a as a penalty okay Yes, another question from Honglu. If my client wants to sell her house, which is tenant, but the yeah. tenant is not willing to accommodate the showings, are there any ways to deal with this situation? Yeah, so um, the landlord is is permitted uh, to have upon reasonable notice to access the home, but if the tenancy is, is not being reasonable, then you apply to the residential tenancy board for an order uh, that specifies certain time frame. So, and that does happen, but you do have to apply. Uh, you apply to the residential tenancy board for an order allowing the, the, and the order that normally comes out because the board is not willing to go into specifics like every Sunday from two to four. They'll just say within 24 hours, written notice given to the tenant and the tenant is ordered to allow that to happen. Now, if they still don't happen, then you go back to the tenancy board say that here's my written notice and here's their refusal and then the, whatever the tenants dispute whatever they say the reasons why then they have to show why and if they're still non-compliance it's going to be and you have to while this stuff happens you think about it um you know you have a purchase and sale going on um, you have a contract and maybe potential buyers um, but then you have to look at the time frames in which you can go to a hearing actually get a resolution um you know uh, and so you apply for these orders, um, and and the, and it's not the same thing as in terms of the other early, uh, applications that I mentioned earlier for notices of evictions. It's not evicting; it's for compliance. And so there's other different rules, and there's no compensation. But you apply to the arbitrator for a ruling. You serve it on the tenant. The our residential tenancy board schedules a hearing. You have exchange of evidence and documents beforehand. They have a ruling, <laughs> but uh, be cognizant of the timeline. Uh, you know, you ha you have a contract of buying and selling one month before, uh, subject to inspection or something like that. Uh, but if the tenant doesn't allow it, then you've got to give some time uh, for things to happen. So whenever you have that situation, be prepared. Give extra time to deal with potential problems with tenants including having to go to the tenancy board to get rulings, okay? Yeah, and then the question from Queenie. Um, her buyer just bought a property, this tenant living in there, and listing agent gave her the lease agreement saying that the tenant will be moved out by the end of the lease. So is that enough or do they need the mutual release form? Um, well, if, no, no. If they, if the, if they if the, if the tenant has is already set, indicated that they're going to leave by the end of the lease and indicated that they want to leave, they don't actually need to sign the mutual end. They would sign that mutual end if they're actually going to leave earlier before the lease is up. And and that's another situation as well. If the buyer um, 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 wants to. Uh, um, whatever the notices that the buyer wants to give, like uh, say for example, you buy the house and there's four months left in the lease, and you want to renovate the place and kick them out. There's still, you know, the 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 landlord, uh, the residential tenancy uh, requires you to have all your permits in place before you do that. Um, so if you have six months left in the lease, uh, then the lease is over and they're they've already indicated they're going to leave. Well, then that's fine. But here's the kicker. The kicker is like, well, maybe the tenant changes their mind, right? <laughs> maybe they decide, ah, you know what? I, I'm not going to leave. I can't find another place. I was going to leave, but then that deal broke through. So <laughs> you you have all these un, un, uh, unanswered questions about what is their future intention after the lease. So in that situation, if you have that mutual end uh, to, to deal with all those issues about their purposes and intentions, they will give vacant possession. They are going to leave, and they and then and uh, whatever the purposes of the buyer for whatever they want to do after the lease ends, it's negotiated upon. Then there's no, um, how would you say, no no guessing, no uncertainty because there is a lot of uncertainty still. Okay. True. Then this, I mean, the mutual 
release form is really important, right? If oh, yeah. you're working for session. Yeah, yeah. If you if you want to um, if you want to have a negotiated uh, uh, agreement that gives you certainty, yeah. Um, if you want to take the risk and they may not, then don't. <laughs> Um, of course, lawyers are usually risk prone. So ask a lawyer, yeah, get something in writing. <laughs> Don't just wing it. <laughs> so I would always try that. Uh, because our, it, the, the residential tenancy board is really quite arbitrary. You never know what the attitude of the board member is. Sometimes they're pro landlord. Sometimes they seem to be pro tenant. Sometimes they don't care. They have their own agenda. Um, sometimes they don't even let you follow the rules. No, no, no. I'm the one asking the questions here. Uh, you you quiet until I ask the question. No, I don't. <laughs> yeah, you get all kinds. Yeah. So, anyways, yeah. yeah. yeah have that, true. Have an agreement. Um, that you negotiated it. Um, you signed off on it. Uh, it's harder to backtrack on something you've agreed upon. And and a mutual like a lease ends on a certain time. You've only agreed upon when it ends, but nothing about after. <laughs> so, okay. And then, uh, hey, Raymond, um, the questions, yeah. How, how about the eviction for the purpose if it is for rezoning and new development? Well, rezoning is normally like, a, like if, if, the, if it was a previously a rental uh, property and uh, it was rezoned to single family housing, that's, that's, that's grounds for a, a frustration of contract um, because it's permanent. Um, and you can say that it was neither the landlord's intention nor the buyer, the more than the tenants. And it's like a, it's a way to say that hey, the contract is frustrated because of the zoning change. And, and there's an actual case which is very good. Um, if we have a, we can have a whole presentation on this as well. It is actually you know <laughs> this is really close by uh, your high point development. There's I think there's a safe way there. Uh, just like a few blocks up uh, from that area is a very, very, uh, very good case on frustration of contract dealing with the empty lot where the old Safeway used to be. Now it's a brand new Safeway, but back then um, there, there was a there was a, a contract of purchase and sales based on a per square foot livable dwelling unit space. And the, the residential, uh, the, the zoning had changed and so that the, the price that was paid uh, by the original buyer was completely uh, uh, defeated in terms of the pr future projections of plans about what they were planning. Uh, obviously, this happened because the deal fell through because of the zoning, and there was a contractual dispute whether the zoning was going to be the zoning change was enough to frustrate the contract, and it was. Okay, because it's not temporary. A lot of the frustration issues was COVID. Is it temporary? Yes, it's temporary. You know, uh, things got worse, but eventually did get better. Um, so, so uh, you know, quite often a lot of the issues about COVID, whether it's frustration of the contract, it, it was always ruled to be in the negative. No, it is not sufficient enough to call a contract, but a, a changing of a zoning uh, that that, uh, that increases or decreases the, uh, you know, uh, per, the, the, the FSR, it's, it's gonna be a big contract. Uh, deal breaker. So, anyways, yes, zoning um, redevelopment is different because that's the purpose of the intention, uh, the intention of the the buyer, the intention. Uh, so it's not a zoning issue. Okay. Okay. Then another question from Emily. Um, as a listing agent, if they are selling a rental property, however, the tenants uh, doesn't allow showing. What can we do? Oh yeah, this was just mentioned earlier. This is a early question. You have to. You can't forcibly enter, so you have to apply for an order from the residential residential tenancy board, ordering the terms and conditions upon which entry can be permitted. Um, the landlord is allowed, but if the tenant disputes it, doesn't allow it to happen, you've got to get a, a extra authority and don't just go in yourself. Um, in fact, I had a client who uh, the previous landlord <laughs> showed up at the door with a bat. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> Because uh, yeah, pretty bad situation. Um, anyways, get a get an order from the uh, the board. Get a history going, showing that the tenancy is not the tenant is not complying, not being reasonable. Showing whatever they've done to pr pr frustrate the showing of a house. Okay, 
because you are allowed. And some some of them cite COVID. They look, these strangers coming in, and I'm afraid, and da da da. Well, you know, you have to have protocols in place to allow it to happen. So, you know, inspection to happen. You need inspection companies have their own evidence and protocols of how to be safe during the inspection. And you provide all that evidence to the board to allow it to happen, including a specified time and place or even a regular time and place, okay? But you have to apply to the residential tenancy board and not okay. to take matters in your own hands, yeah. True. And then another good question from St. Francis. So if the tenant um, signed the mutual agreement to vacant and then the new buyer get the vacant possession, how about if the buyer becomes the owner and rent it out? Is there any, can the previous tenant came for that 12 months compensation? No, no, because they signed the mutual agreement and, um, you know, as long as the, the purposes upon which the, if you indicate that the reasons for the uh, ending of the tenancy, usually that means that the, you know, it is within not the timing in which they're leaving is is put into question and the purposes is given to the tenant and it's written into the agreement then then there's no grounds to go back because it's not a surprise like if you change the reasons look i'm i would grant mutual and to agree the tenancy because my family is moving in that was a purpose and that was indicated in the agreement they signed off on it but then later on the, the buyer says so actually no it's not my family moving in actually uh i'm gonna pen to re-rent it and renovate it and send it all out well then that's a that's a that's a that's a misrepresentation that led to the signing of the agreement so you misrepresented yourself in order to induce the tenant to sign a mutual agreement to end um so that can be challenged okay okay and then yeah we do a Quick one, two more questions. Yeah, Raymond said uh, there's some tenants ask for five fifty dollars for showing each time. Is it can it be happened? Sorry, I say if per showing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, some ten, yeah, yeah, they ask for money. Well, yeah, well, you know, it's not it's, a is not illegal. In fact, that you can even come to an agreement to make it easier. Think about the cost. I think it costs fifty dollars itself to apply for an arbitration to hear it. It then then it takes time to prepare for the hearing, and if you decide, hey, I don't know how to conduct a hearing, what to do at a hearing, I have to hire a lawyer to do it at three fifty an hour, uh, which is my rate, by the way. <laughs> Sorry. So then it's costly, and if whatever you offer a little bit to, hey, here's a few bucks to to mind your convenience, um, to to facilitate things, it, it's okay, you know. This it's not, you know, it it, it helps. Uh, it helps a little bit. It is a bit of an inconvenience, uh, but I prefer that they have an agreement as to protocols and timing and a, an agreement as to uh, when and how how they can be safe and include that if uh, if it's a little something to make it easier, sure, why not? And then the last question on Alien. If the buyers want to take the tendency, is there anything we can protect the buyer if there's um, any um, um, payment rent from the previous oh yeah yeah so i would um so how to if you if you want to do full disclosure of the terms of the condition of the of the tenancy not only you do the you get the agreement you get you get uh, you know similar i don't know if you realtors uh, have are familiar with the commercial real estate because i do commercial as well and unfortunately they don't have the same thing in, in residential as they do in commercial such as called estoppel certificates those of you who do commercial are familiar with that. So we get the tenants to confirm that there's no rent uh, owing. Uh, there's nothing uh, from the landlord that is owing to the tenant. There's no disputes, there's no lawsuits, everything's on time, everything's in order, all's in compliance. And you get the tenants to sign off and, and on behalf of a buyer of a commercial real estate with tenants, that's what I would require and be part of the contract. Uh, the, the seller will provide estoppel certificates from the tenancy to confirm. Now, if you can do that with a per potential purchasers um, for a tenancy that's in the that's in the home, the, so much the better. You get a confirmation from the tenants um, that the there's no um, the rent is all up to date. There's nothing, no repairs that the landlord was obligated to do and have not yet done, et cetera, et cetera. So if you can get that. Um, so you you, know, you put it this into the contract at some point. Seller will provide uh, or make representations 
um, about the condition of the tenancy. The, the seller warrants that rents are up to date. There's no proceedings before the residential tenancy board. Uh, there's, there's nothing, no repair orders, no extending issues between the landlord and the tenant. And here's another thing to do. Like usually the in that situation where I had a client that bought a house on the day of possession gave the notice of eviction at the same time that the tenants gave the list of repairs that this previous landlord was supposed to do is uh, have a hold back, you know? Um, you can even renegotiate that. Um, uh, held back uh, for the time frame in which, uh, you know, negotiate a time frame in which no, the tenancy doesn't, um, no issues that are, will arise from the tenants after the completion. Uh, you know, that something can be done. I, I would, I would, I prefer um, that the uh, due diligence is done before purchase and do everything you check beforehand and don't leave it up to, to, to in fact, something was missed and wait for it and have money held back just in case it wasn't, okay? Okay, thank you, Hyphen. I think that's it. And then, yeah, today's uh, information is very, uh, very useful. And any chance if you can share the file with me so that I can send out to all our realtors? Yeah, yeah. And if the realtors want a hyperlink one, because I'll send you the Adobe and the PDA. Uh, or if you want, I can do PDF. But if you want hyperlinks, then it has to be my word. And you can email that. And if because then I then I embed the uh, legislation and case law with uh, with the presentation. Okay, you can't do that with Adobe or PowerPoint, but I can do that with Word and uh, with, uh, or even email. So I I say I recommend that uh, my emails up there on the PDF. You ask me, send me an email, say that you're at the presentation with uh, Royal Pacific Realty Group, um, and then I'd be happy to do that. Um, so hey. Prize time, uh, we still have in 24. I'm gonna type in my question. And do you guys see it all? Oh yeah, you have the lucky draw, right? <laughs> yeah, I do. So my initials K, oh, I guess people can read the Chinese. <laughs> but say it in English, what my <laughs> what the K and the S stands for. The first one to type it in gets the Amazon gift card um, emailed to them. Um. I'm looking at the chat. But yeah, the conversation bubble. Ca Cantonese, right. Cantonese version, guys. Oh, there you go, Raymond. Raymond K. <laughs> so Raymond, uh, yeah, you can, uh, Raymond, uh, give me your email and this card. This card, sorry. I guess I could, uh, be more challenging, I suppose. <laughs> Anyways, that's good. So send me a card and email, and uh, and you're the you're the lucky winner. I'll send this Amazon gift card. Um, so yeah, I've been. Uh, it's nice and easy. You can you can you can use it on. Uh, hopefully, you got Amazon. So everybody's doing the internet economy nowadays. So um, I just want to say one more thing. I want to thank again uh, uh, David Tam uh, for inviting me. Um, uh, Sing Yo for having me at your uh, presentation today and for your realtors and I'm looking forward to uh, um, being able to share more if you guys uh, want to let uh, Sing or D uh, Dave about topics, uh, questions, um, even just a general, you know, pre-sales and uh, I do a lot of issues that have been risen up as uh, GST on assignments, pre-sales, uh, uh, applicable, not applicable, applicable, how to protect buyers, assignees, and how to deal with non-resident assigners. So all kinds of issues. Feel free. Um, I, I, I'm glad I had the chance today to do this, and it's kind of nice. But um, let me know if you need more. Okay. Let let Dave know and let uh, Singh know. And thank you, Singh, and thank you, Dave. And, you. Uh, Christine, and Christine, especially, because I'm new to this. Uh, I've been learning Zoom the last couple of months. I almost somewhat familiar, but when you said go to meeting, I said, oh no, not another one. But uh, thanks, Christine, for running through with me yesterday how to how to how to do this. Okay. Yeah, no problem. You did a very good job. Yeah, very yeah. good, very smooth. Yeah. Thank you, Ivan. Yeah. Thank you. This is this is very smooth. You know, compared to the Kappa, Kappa, they were sat down and uh, no go smoothly. Oh. Our is much much better. Yeah, yeah the yeah. Zoom. I got a different microphone and everything. Yeah. And so yeah, it's better. This is very <laughs> clear. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, thank you, Ivan. Uh, you know, uh, Ivan can speak uh, Guangdonghua. Uh, he can speak uh, Putonghua. 
<laughs> so is yeah. anything uh, you want to contact him? Of course, uh, in his law office, he can, people can speak Mandarin as well. No problem. You know, Cantonese, of course. Yeah, so uh, any problem there, just contact them. And I must thank you for the Christine, our main broker, yeah, for the unit life and the scene, do a great job to get this uh, go to Zoom meeting. It's always, you know, no problem. And I want to thank you, our technical people, uh, Steve and uh, Bill, you know, getting all these things go smooth. Okay, we have more more uh, seminar going on, uh, and uh, hoping that uh, we can go for the next one in future. Okay, uh, thank you again, everyone. Make sure that uh, Christine you want to say something before they go away, or, or um, yeah, just yeah. Thank you for thank you saying thank you for your support okay. and thank you all the routers. Um, Nothing can happen without you guys. Yeah, 100 people or something. Cheers, yeah. And then, yeah, remember to sign out and, and in the chat box and I will take care of it. So don't, do, don't have to worry about it. All right? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Ivan, thank, thank you. Okay, yeah. you guys take care. Take care, okay. yeah. Okay. I can't remember how to turn this off. <laughs> I'm looking at all these buttons. <laughs> Sign off. All right. Thanks. You. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Saying in person, though. Of course. Yeah. This is, this is nice, but in person, though, is better. Yeah. Wow. Well, thanks, Sing. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye, everyone. Okay. Bye. Okay, bye. Hi, is there a sign out to just the left? How how did you sign out? Yeah, still fifty or four people. How to sign out? Um, you Anybody? just have to type your number and your V number in the chat box. Can you see the uh, conversation bubble on your right top corner? Right that's a, that's a corner, different. and then just click the and then type your name and your V number. Oh, uh, where to type? Sorry. <laughs> where to right type? Uh... Name, yeah. Oh, Just... okay, okay, I see. Good, okay. good, good. You learned mm -hmm. something new today. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thank you. This is Raymond Cole. Okay.